Good afternoon, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased you could join us for this afternoon's program, whether you're here in the theater or joining us on Facebook or YouTube. Before we hear from today's speaker, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. On Tuesday, February 25th at noon, Fergus Bordovich will be here to tell us about his new book, Congress at War, How Republican Reformers Fought the Civil, F Civil War, Defied Lincoln, Ended Slavery, and Remade America. This new book sh sh uh, describes the lasting changes enacted by the Republican Party during the Civil War and Reconstruction. And on Tuesday, March 10th at noon, Jonathan Horn tells the story of post-presidency George Washington in his new book, Washington's End, The Final Years and Forgotten Struggle. To keep informed about these events and others throughout the year, check our website, archives.gov, or sign up at the table outside the, the theater to receive email alerts. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation, and the foundation supports our education and outreach activities. Check out their website, archivesfoundation.org, for more information. 122 years ago this month, on February 22, 1898, an African-American postmaster in South Carolina was murdered by a white mob. Frazier Baker and his family were awoken by a fire set to their house, and as they tried to flee, the mob shot at them. The story of the Baker lynching and many other similar attacks on African Americans can be found in Justice Department records here at the National Archives. These atrocities were not confined to the 19th century. During the civil rights era of the mid-20th century, many people were harassed, assaulted, and brutally murdered for attempting to end white terrorism, Jim Crow, and discrimination in employment, neighborhoods, and schools. In some cases, those responsible for the attacks were never brought to justice. Today, Jerry Mitchell tells us about his firsthand experience with reopening four infamous killings from the civil rights era. Many more cases remain unresolved, and on January 8, 2019, the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Collection Act of 2018 was signed into law. The law mandates that the National Archives and Records Administration establish a collection of copies of civil rights cold cases, cold case records. The collection will include cold cases in which incidents occurred between January 1, 1940 and December 31, 1979. When completed, the collection will reveal that many years of ra racism, pain, loss, humiliation, and marginalization will not be forgotten. Jerry Mitchell is one of the most decorated investigative journalists in this nation, having won over 30 national awards, including a MacArthur Genius Grant, Columbia University's John Chancellor Award, the Sidney Hillman Prize, and the George Polk Award, as well as, be, as, as, well as having been named a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Since 1989, an investigative journalist for the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi, he has unearthed documents, cajoled suspects and witnesses, and quietly pursued evidence in some of the nation's most notorious killings. His stories have also exposed injustices, incompetence, and corruption, helping to lead to investigations, exonerations, firings, and reforms of state agencies. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jerry Mitchell. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, it's a, a great honor to be with you here in this building, in this place. Uh, it seems only fitting that we talk about these things. Um, but uh, my book is Race Against Time. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but I just kind of want to tell stories. I mean, that's what we do in the South anyway, right? <laughs> just tell stories. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if you're like me, but if someone tells me I can't have something, I want it like a million times worse. Anybody else like that? Am I the only one here? Um, so there was something in Mississippi called the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. And it was a state segregationist spy agency, which may be hard for you to kind of imagine these days. But it was kind of the state's equivalent of a white citizens council that, that operated uh, not just in the South, but in the North as well. And sometimes people forget that. Um, 
it, it, you know, it spread beyond the South, but it was uh, the White Citizens Council course created in response to Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. The Mississippi Sovereignty Commission was created in 1956. It spied on um, more than 10,000 people, including, interestingly, Elvis Presley. <laughs> Um, so it held these spy files, more than 132,000 pages of spy files. And there was a, a lawsuit involving this that was going on at the time as well. And when I found out that the Mississippi legislature had sealed all those records for 50 years, my first thought was, well, there's got to be something in there, right? You know? And they wouldn't be sealing them for 50 years. So I began to develop sources who had access to the files, began to leak me the files. I know I shouldn't be talking about this in National Archives about files being leaked, but anyway. But uh, I did have someone leak me the files. And um, what it shows is that at the same time the state of Mississippi was prosecuting a guy named Byron D. LeBeckwith for the murder of Meg Revers. You know, and um, Meg Revers to tell a little bit more about him because I do want you to know who he is. Meg Revers was the first field secretary for the Mississippi NAACP, and he actually uh, attempted. This is like years before James Meredith. James Meredith was sixty-two when he was admitted to Ole Miss. University of Mississippi in 62. This is all the way back in 1954, actually even before Brown versus Board of Education. Meg Rivers applied to attend the University of Mississippi Law School and was turned away because of the color of his skin. You know, of course, they had lots of excuses why they weren't going to do it, um, but that was among them, you know, that, that basically rejected him because of his skin color. Um, to, to back up a little bit more, I should tell you this, too, about Meg Revers, is he, he fought in World War II, and this is kind of representative. I'd say sometimes when you talk about history, people will say that the modern civil rights movement began with the Brown versus Board of Education decision. A lot of history books kind of put it that way. But I think more accurately, people like Meg Revers were the ones who came home from fighting the Nazis and came home to fight racism all over again in the form of Jim Crow that barred African Americans from restaurants, restrooms, uh, voting booths. And so Meg Rivers was a part of that. He actually, he and his brother and some other veterans of War II actually went to try to register or, or tried to go vote. They were already registered. They were trying to go vote and were basically turned away by white men with guns. This was in Decatur, Mississippi in 1946, and it was actually Meg Rivers' uh, 21st birthday, July 2nd, 1946. So he was dedicated to voting, voting rights, civil rights movement before we kind of know of it as the civil rights movement. Um, and so he was dedicated to that, and he kind of became a target. In fact, not long before... Um, he, he was assassinated in Jackson on June 12th of 1963. Um, he had got, was able to win an FCC decision. It was a pretty important decision that allowed him to have equal time. The, the white mayor of Jackson got up and basically talked about how wonderful, you know, everyone was happy, you know, why, why all this trouble? And the, the trouble was caused by these outsiders, you know, and nobody, and of course, Meg Rivers had equal time to respond, said, I'm from Mississippi, you know what I mean? I'm not an outsider, I live here. And, um, and so within a month after that is when Meg Rivers was killed. And he was killed on the same night that President Kennedy told the nation that the grandsons of slaves were still not free. And when he walked out of his car that night, stepped out of his car, he was shot in the back. And his wife and children, you know, came outside, saw the blood, and screamed. He died about an hour later. Um, now, 20, well, 26 years later, um, uh, basically, I ended up finding, like I mentioned, I, I 
with these documents, I found out that that basically Byron D. Beckwith was being prosecuted at the same time he's being prosecuted. This other arm of the state, the Sovereignty Commission, was secretly assisting the defense, trying to get Beckwith acquitted, and nobody knew it. And so, at the time that my story ran, which was October first of 1989. Uh, the odds were literally more than a million one against this case ever being reopened and reprosecuted. There was no murder weapon. There was no transcript. There was no nothing in the court file. No evidence. No no murder weapon. Nothing of any kind of value in the court files. But Merle Evers, this is her, uh, the widow of Megar Evers, believed and she prayed, and some amazing things happened. A couple of months later, Jackson police are cleaning out a closet happened to find a box that contained the crime scene photographs of the killing of Megar Evers, including the fingerprint of Byron D. LeBeck with lifted from the murder weapon. A few months after that, Merle Evers shared with me her copy of the court transcript that she had saved in a safety deposit box. And a few months after that, the prosecutor in the case found the murder weapon in his father-in-law's closet, which sounds like I'm making it up, but it really, it really happened. Um, so I ended up going to interview Mr. Beckwith. He lived in Signal Mountain, Tennessee. You can see how I found his home pretty easily <laughs> by what he had hanging outside. Um, and so he lived in Signal Mountain, Tennessee, which is just outside of Chattanooga. In fact, kind of an interesting side note on that. Lookout uh, Signal Mountain, there are two mountains there, Signal Mountain and Lookout Mountain. What you might remember, if you remember the reference to Lookout Mountain, was mentioned, and I have a dream speech. And so they both were havens for the Klan, you know, and that's, I, I'm convinced that's why King invoked the Lookout Mountain reference. But I went to visit him. Um, this is in April of 1990. Uh, spent about six hours talking to him. Absolutely the most racist person I ever spent serious time with. It was like inward this, inward that. Um, he was a part, his belief system is a part of what's called Christian identity. I don't know if anyone's heard of Christian identity before. Here's a quick primer on Christian identity. So this is very offensive in me describing it, but I'm going to tell it bluntly so it makes it quicker. So a Christian identity believes that Adam and Eve were white people, Okay. This is like horribly racist, okay? They believe that all the non-white races were created on the sixth day with the animals and therefore have no souls. And they believe that Eve had sex with the serpent Satan, and this is where Jews come from. Horribly racist. But uh, this is exactly what they believe. I'm, and this is what he told me. <laughs> uh, and, and so, like I said, it's been about six hours talking to him, and... You know, you know, there's some people you get done talking with, you feel like you need to go take a shower or something. This was one of those times, you know. And so it was getting dark, and he, and I, I thought it was a good time to go. And uh, he insisted on, like, walking me out to the car. And I'm like, really? I, that, that's okay. I, I think I can find my way to the car. So he walks me out anyway, gets me out to the car and says, if you write positive things about white Caucasian Christians, God will bless you. If you write negative things about white Caucasian Christians, God will punish you. If God does not punish you directly, several individuals will do it for him. And so his wife had made me a sandwich. I think you can guess what I did with the sandwich. So... Byron D. LeBeckwith was indicted for the murder of Megar Evers in December of 1990. Uh, at the time I came and interviewed him, he didn't know that I was the one who wrote the story that got the case reopened. Just remember, this is pre-internet. And uh, but by the time you know he lost his fight with extra, you know, he, he got extradited. He got indicted. He got extradited. He fought extradition essentially. And finally wound up back in Mississippi. By the time he wound up back in Mississippi, he'd figured it out. <laughs> so when he saw me across the courtroom, he goes, sit up over there. When he dies, he's going to Africa. I turned to a friend of mine and went, you know, I've always wanted to go to Africa. So not surprisingly, uh, Byron D. LeBeckwith was convicted in that case 
and sentenced uh, to life in prison. And when the word guilty rang out, you could hear the waves of joy as they cascaded down the hall. Uh, to four-year people, black and white, just erupted in cheers. And I just felt chills because the impossible had suddenly become possible. And Merle Evers and her daughter, Rena, cheered as well. Um, not too long after Byron Dielbeck was, was indicted, and this kind of gave hope to a lot of families, right? You know, because suddenly they see, oh, wait a minute, what about my family? What about my, you know, what about my sister or my brother or my mother or my dad or whatever? Um, and so I, not too long after Beck was indicted, I was contacted by this family. This is the Vernon Damer family. This is Ellie Damer, and she's holding a, a picture of her husband, um, Vernon Damer. Vernon Damer was a farmer, a businessman, an entrepreneur. He had about 200 acres that he would grow various things, cotton and crops of, of various sorts. Um, but the thing was, he was dedicated to voting rights. He believed that voting rights, if African Americans truly got the right to vote in places like Mississippi, that it would change Mississippi and change the nation. And he was right. But the Klan didn't like that. And so they attacked him and his family in the middle of the night, January 10th, 1966. Klan firebombed their house, began firing their guns into the house. Vernon Damer woke up, grabbed a shotgun, ran to the front of the house, began firing back the Klansmen so his family could escape safely out a back window. Unfortunately, the flames of the fire seared his lungs, and he died later that day. A few weeks later, in the mail came, his voter registration card. He had fought his whole life for the right of all Americans to be able to vote, but never been able to cast a ballot himself. The guy, um, let me say one other thing about his family is fascinating to me. He had seven sons. Six of them served in our armed forces a total of 78 years. Isn't that something? And four of them were serving our country at the very moment this happened. They were away in Germany and other places, and this is what they came home to find. To me, it's one of the most striking photographs of the Civil Rights Movement. You don't, you don't really see it. It's, it's one of those photos that's kind of been forgotten, but it's an incredible moving photo. In fact, I'll add as a little side note on this photo. This is huge, by the way, in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, which I highly recommend. If you ever make it to Mississippi, um, the Civil Rights Museum in Mississippi is actually, might surprise you, is actually, I think, personally, the best, of the, what I call regional civil rights museums in the country. I think it's, it's incredible. But this photo is very, very, very large and displayed. The thing that's interesting about this photo is who took it. It was taken by... Chris McNair, whose daughter is Denise McNair, and that may or may not register with you, but Denise McNair is one of the four little girls killed in the Birmingham church bombing. He took this photograph. The, um, the guy who ordered this killing uh, was this guy. Sam Bowers is the head of the White Knights, the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi. He also ascribed a Christian identity, by the way. Um, and so uh, the White Knights were the most violent Klan organization in the United States, responsible for at least 10 killings that we know of. Bowers have been tried in the Damer case but never been convicted. Um, and so um, after the Damer family met with me, uh, they met with the district attorney. He acted interested, got, you know, began to kind of work on it. But gradually got cold feet. It's like, yeah, I don't. He had this excuse, you know, like, well, we we don't have an investigator who can work on this. Well, the legislature passed one. Well, we don't have the FBI files. Well, then the FBI let him see the files, you know. And so all these excuses that kind of gotten taken care of, and uh, he still wouldn't do it. And and then he left office, and then a new DA came in. 
and this was like starting all over because now it's a whole new investigator and, and, you know, just starting literally from scratch. And so I happened to get, um, uh, an offer from Ohio state to, to come and get my master's for free, essentially. And they would pay me on top of that. So I did it. And I was literally in Ohio when I got a telephone call, uh, from this guy who claimed he had information on the Vernon Damer case. And so I'm like, okay. And so I flew back to Mississippi, met with him. It was him and a buddy, uh, two sons of Vernon Damer, Jerry Himmelstein from the Anti-Defamation League, because this guy was talking about he might have to be, he and his family might have to be relocated. Um, and so I think there were more than a few guns there that day. <laughs> Uh, and so we met and it turned out this guy had worked for Sam Bowers. He, uh, was a kid at the time and worked for Sam Bowers. He had actually overheard Sam Bowers give the orders to kill Vernon Damon. And I might add kind of an interesting side note about the guy whose name was Bob Stringer, um, is he was a recovering gambling addict. And uh, Bob was working through the 12 step programs. And one of the 12 steps is to make amends for the bad stuff you've done in the past, which helped lead to him coming forward. The guy had been the key witness back in it. I should mention that after Bob met with us, he met with the district attorney. They reopened the case in earnest. Uh, the guy who had kind of been the key witness back in the 1960s, there were a few trials, was this guy whose name is uh, Billy Roy Pitts. Billy Roy Pitts was involved in the killing of Vernon Damer, dropped his gun, got caught, plead guilty, got a life sentence for that, plead guilty to federal charges, got five years for that. And so I was kind of researching to find out how much actual time some of these guys did, including Pitts. Um, and so what I had always heard, because I couldn't find a record of his state time, and I've been told he went into the Federal Witness Protection Program, and that was the reason why I couldn't find it. So I'm talking to an archivist here up in Washington at the Federal Bureau of Prisons. She pulled his file, and I'm trying to find out exactly how much time did he spend behind bars. And she came, read from his file, and said, well, three years, three and a half years. I said, well, now I understand he left, you know, federal prison and went into the Witness Protection Program. And the archivist said, that's impossible. Well, what are you talking about? There was no witness protection program back then. What this meant was Billy Roy Pitts had never served a single day of his life sentence in Mississippi. Kind of a big oversight, right? You know, you don't hear about that one every day. And so um, I didn't know if Billy Roy Pitts was alive, if he was dead, where he was. But there was a, a, a internet site that I knew about, you know, that you didn't have to put in the city or the state. You could just put in the name and take your chances. And so I did, and up it popped. Billy Roy Pitts had his address, Denham Springs, Louisiana, his telephone number. So I called him. First 20 minutes of the conversation went like this. How'd you find me? How'd you find me? It's on the internet. The internet, I got a listed telephone number. I'm like, well, I guess you have to take it up with them. So the result of my story that he had never served a single day of his life sentence, Mississippi authorities issued a warrant for his arrest. Uh, he didn't like that. In fact, he ran. And while he was on the run, he sent me this audio cassette in the mail. I'm sure you all remember those audio cassettes like me. And an audio cassette in the mail, I got it, I played it, and this is how it began. Jerry, I just thought I'd let you know. You've ruined my life. But I promise if I talk to anybody, I'd talk to you. So here's this tape. And on this tape, he proceeds to tell me all about his involvement, killing Vernon Damer, all about his involvement, all this other clan violence. So shortly after this, he turned himself into authorities. And this, now, this is now May of, 19, May of 1998. This leads to the arrest of Sam Bowers. Uh, in addition to ba uh, Bowers' arrest, also arrested, was a guy by the name of Devers Nix. And Devers was the head of, and I swear I'm not making this up, the Klan Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> you don't have those files now, do you? <laughs> I've actually seen some of them. Uh, they're funny, actually. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so bad. Um, 
So when the family brought Devers Nix in, it was like the most pitiful sight you've ever seen. They like wheeled him in with the wheelchair. He's got the oxygen tank, you can see, and they wheel him up in front of the judge, and he's in fr up in front of the judge, and he's like, I can't take more than a couple steps without needing oxygen, judge. And the judge is like, well, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to let you out without bond. A dozen days later, this is like a reporter's dream. This is where we caught him. <laughs> so he got arrested. <laughs> yeah, he loved me. Um, so fast forward now, Sam Bowers goes on trial, and guess who's there to testify on his behalf? But Devers and X. Of course, this is tricky. <clears throat> You know about your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, which you can claim at any time. Well, his lawyer, you know, that represented him in the 60s was continuing to represent him. And I'm, I'm going to share a few details. I don't mean he's cruel at all. I'm just sharing. You know, the reason for the detail will be clear. So the same lawyer represented him. He's a really good criminal defense lawyer in the 60s. Um, by now, was in his 80s. In fact, they actually brought him from the nursing home to the courtroom. And so he's trying to work out, trying to work out a signaling system. You know, like if he needs to take the fifth, he says, now Devers, when you get up there, if you need to take the fifth, I'm going to raise my hand. Devers is like, okay, okay. So Devers gets up on the witness stand. He starts testifying. I looked over at his lawyer about five minutes later. He probably guessed this part. You know what his lawyer was doing? <laughs> so Devers kept right on testifying. Yeah, I was in the Klan. You know, he tried to put a positive spin on it like there is one. Why, the Klan was a benevolent organization, passing out fruit baskets to the needy at Christmas. And under, under cross-examination, prosecutor got him and said, Mr. Nix, just how many fruit baskets did you pass out? And Devers says, oh, sad to say, none. <laughs> Absolutely the funniest trial I ever covered in my life as a reporter. Deadly serious manner, but funny trial. The, the guy who represented Bowers uh, was this guy on the right. His name is Travis Buckley, okay? And the thing to know about Travis Buckley, he was not just a lawyer for the Klan. In fact, he represented several of these Klan guys that I wrote about. Um, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but he's not just a lawyer for the Klan. He was a leader in the Klan. You got that? <laughs> All right. And the thing you should... So he was also indicted for the Damer firebombing at one point. So I haven't told you that detail. The, uh, so Bill Pitts is testifying. And there's a planning meeting that took place about a month prior to the attack on Vernon Damer and his family. And so Billy Roy Pitts is testifying. The prosecutor's asking about the planning meeting. And said, now, who was at the planning meeting? And Pitts is like, well, I was there. Sam Bowers was there. Debra's Nix was there. Travis Buckley was there. And I'm looking over at Buckley, and I just see, like, no reaction, Right. And then the court reporter goes, uh, what were those names again? <laughs> and he's like, Billy Roy Pitts, Sam Bowers, Devers Nix, Travis Buckley. Now Buckley heard it. <laughs> and he jumps up. I have a matter of utmost urgent to the court. I, I need to discuss outside the jury's presence. <laughs> you know, I've covered a lot of trials in my life. That's the only trial I ever cover where a witness implicated the defense lawyer himself. <sighs> you can't make this stuff up. This is, this is why I love the, love the real thing, you know, is you can't make it up. And so Sam Bowers was convicted on August 21st, 1998, uh, and given a life sentence just like Beckwith. Uh, the, the sad part about this story, and this is unfortunately how history goes sometimes, is history is not a straight line, right? History tends to run 
I kind of think of it as in circles, not the same circle, but concentric circles, if you want to think of it that way. In other words, it kind of repeats, but doesn't repeat exactly. Um, but the unfortunate part is that the hate that caused this has never really gone away. And uh, five years ago, a young, young white man entered this church uh, in Charleston and killed these nine beautiful people. A couple of years ago in Pittsburgh, um, a man who was determined to destroy the Jews, as he put it, um, walked in his synagogue in Pittsburgh and killed 11 people. And then just last year in El Paso, uh, a man who wanted to prevent the invasion of America, as he put it, uh, killed 22 people in El Paso and injured dozens more. Um, you know, I've been, uh, people ask me sometimes about, because I've received more than a few share, more than a few share, a few death threats over the years. And um, and people have asked me about that. And it's, you know, obviously, like I had one guy say he wanted to slit my throat. And another guy said he had pictures of me and knew where, knew where, where I lived and, and all that kind of stuff. And it kind of interestingly led to an unexpected gift. And that is the gift of living fearlessly. And living fearlessly is not about living without fear. It's about living beyond fear, right? Living fearlessly is about living for something greater than ourselves. And is that what we see in the civil rights movement with Vernon Damer, Meg Rebers, and so many other college students who came down as, to Mississippi as part of Freedom Summer? And, of course, three of them were killed as a part of that. Um, but um, to date now, and this is Matt, uh, there have been 24 convictions in these cases. I write about four of the cases. I'm only talking about two because, uh, you know, my time's limited here. But, uh, but there have been 24 convictions. And it's a matter, matter of faith with me, but I believe God's hand's been involved in these cases. Um, but the most amazing thing I've witnessed, interestingly, is not the convictions. It's been some of the racial reconciliation. Not too long after Sam Bowers was convicted, there was a hearing where Billy Roy Pitts testified. And when he got done, he walked to the back of the courtroom and he ran into Mrs. Damer. And he apologized to Mrs. Damer and asked her to forgive him for killing her husband. And she forgave him. And she began to cry. He began to cry. And isn't that what redemption's all about, trying to make things right, even when they've gone so terribly wrong in the past? May God bless you in your journey of redemption. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, I love these stories. I, I do have a couple, you know, this is the, where the advertisements come in. <laughs> so uh, this is the book, which you're, you'll be able to get in a minute after the questions. And uh, I don't know, I'm, you know, it's like your baby. I don't know. I've never done it. This is my first book. So I've never, you know, it's kind of like having a baby. And you're kind of, you know, anybody you run into, you're wanting to show pictures of it, you know. <laughs> and that's kind of the way it goes, I guess. Uh, so I'm just, it's all new to me. I've never done a book tour. And so this is week three of my book tour and, and it's been great. And you guys are great. And, uh, so I'm happy to talk about it, uh, uh any, with you as well. Um, the, um, this is the nonprofit I just started last year It's called the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting. And we just feel like that Mississippi needs more investigative reporting, not less. And we're the ones who actually uh, broke the stories on the prisons of Mississippi and reported on the horrible conditions. And you may have heard in the national news, we basically told Mississippi officials were on notice that, it, that these prisons were going to blow up, and they did in December. And uh, that's our website, MississippiCIR.org. Um, 
And obviously, you know, when people have a lot of money that want to give it to us, we, we, we would love that because we are indeed a nonprofit. <laughs> I can assure you of that. And here's all my contact info, which you're welcome to uh, follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Also, I should add their Instagram. It's the same, the same as my Twitter. Instagram's the same as my Twitter. Um, I'm trying to post on Instagram. I'm not very good at it yet. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm much better about Facebook and Twitter. Um, but the thing I do on my Facebook page you might be interested in, like the, the incident you mentioned about the, the murder, I post stuff like that every day so that every day you actually get today in civil rights history and learn these things. And it's amazing, and I'm getting the same reaction from my book, it's amazing how many people had come back to me almost every day, white and black, and say, I never knew this. They never taught me this in school. And I certainly was never taught any of this in school. And so it's very fascinating and very interesting. And, and a lot of people who've read my book have said the same thing. I never knew all this happened. Because we're not. I mean, because the civil rights movement in America, unfortunately, is typically taught like this. Rosa Parks sat down. Martin Luther King stood up. And African Americans got their rights. Right? And, 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 the, and the sad part about that is it leaves out the local people who were so critical to uh, change happening, right? I mean, for instance, we'll just make it real simple here. Rosa Parks wasn't the first woman who sat down on a bus in Montgomery in 1955. She was, and got, and got arrested. She was the fifth woman arrested that year, not the first. Um, the, uh, and of course, Martin Luther King, I mean, I think to reduce the movement to Martin Luther King is a, an unfortunate thing. I'm not trying to take anything away from him at all, but it, it were so many local people, but I do see a move toward that. I think the Mississippi civil rights museum does a pretty good job of that. Um, which is to try to begin to recognize these local people like an Amzi Moore in Mississippi or, a, um, you know, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, which a lot of people don't even know who Dr. T.R.M. Howard is, and uh, incredible. I mean, they had crowds of 10 to 15,000 in the Mississippi Delta in the early 1950s before there was, quote, a civil rights movement. They actually had a campaign of bumper stickers, and Meg Evers was involved in this too, that because he worked for Dr. Howard, a bumper sticker that said, don't buy gas where you can't use the restroom. How about that? So anyway, I post about this stuff all the time. And uh, so if you like this history like I do, it's fascinating. And we're working on a national website as well, trying to get funding for a national website. We're talking to Kellogg and we're talking to some others. Let's try to have a national website that will basically, so that students and adults too can learn these stories. Because, you know, if we don't, and it's been said many times, but it's true, if we don't learn our history, we tend to repeat it, don't we? And that's why it's important. We, it's important to document history and tell, and that's what I commend National Archives for what all you do to, to help preserve that history and make sure that these stories are told. And that's it. That's the end of the commercials. Uh, open up the questions, and I think they told me they're taping this, or, or it's on YouTube, pardon me. Uh, so if you got a question, go to the edges and ask away. Go ahead. Mr. Mitchell, thank you very much for being here today. Um, my name is Nathan, and I'm a local college student here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, I started reading your book, and I'm finding it to be truly meaningful. After completing my studies, I'm seriously considering teaching civil rights history. Um, my question is, um, I was thinking back to what you were saying at the beginning of your talk today about the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, and I was reading in your book about how about how you had a sense that uh, about how you had a strong sense that there was information about the Mississippi burning case yep. with, the, with the three civil rights workers, um, and about how the information in the files ultimately ultimately led to further information about that case. Would you be able to talk some about sure. the, talk about, about that? that case? Yeah, what are you talking about? There were uh, the files showed that. The state of Mississippi or the Sovereignty Commission had spied on Mickey Schwerner and his wife, Rita. And then that, they basically did a spy report on them. 
like described them physically, described their, you know, gave their license plate, gave everything in that report, and then shared that report with the police department in Meridian, Mississippi. Now, Meridian may not mean anything to you. Neshoba County, you might know about that because that's where the civil rights workers were killed. But the other part of that is you must understand that the vast majority of the Klansmen who were involved in killing those three young men lived in Meridian, okay? And so the other thing is, so they gave it to the Meridian Police Department. Probably at least half of the people that belonged to the Meridian Police Department back then were members of the KKK. And so, in fact, the, the guy was the main shooter, the killer of these three young men, Alton Wayne Roberts, his brother, Lee, was a police officer in Meridian. So you follow what I'm saying? It, it, it's, and so you can see the direct connection between, obviously, the spying and, and, and that, getting, that information getting into the hands of the clans, Klansmen who began referring to Schwerner as Goatee. And that was kind of their, their nickname for him because he did, in fact, have a goatee. And, and they were determined to kill goatee. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to also uh, add to what he mentioned about your start with this presentation with the State Sovereign Commission. How far does this rabbit hole go in regards to what you mentioned, things needing to be put away for 50 years, obviously, so people will be deceased and disappear? What right. state lines are we talking about in regards to state sovereign, X state um, the overlap into other areas in the South that may also have similar projects. Yeah, they had similar. It wasn't alone in that. And a lot of states copied uh, Alabama, Arkansas, and then there were some other states. Uh, Louisiana, they, they kind of went under different names. It was essentially these kind of agencies or organizations that were determined to stop integration or desegregation. For all the cold cases out there, the thousands that occurred, if you were not getting access to that information, would that not have led to your 89 and 90 opportunity yeah, I, of opening I mean, the doors? Yeah, if it had for the Sovereignty Commission stuff, the, the, the Megar Evers case probably wouldn't have been reopened. So it sounds like there's a lot of work to be done out there. Yeah, there's a lot. Thank the you. good news is in 98, they did reopen. They did open the Sovereignty Commission records, and they've gradually opened more. And I think... Basically, other than the, what we would call the ones that were concealed with regard to privacy, uh, it's open now. Of course, the copies I got weren't redacted, so I've, I've got the unredacted. I've got like 2,400 pages of unredacted stuff, but anyway, go ahead. Mr. Mitchell, you um, alluded to uh, education issues and public yes. policy and presentation. Um, what is your personal feeling in terms of where do you think we need to go as a nation in terms of things like removing the battlefield from the Mississippi flag, such as this removing of statues from public areas, um, yeah. such as um, uh, question. yeah, such as uh, being able to uh, emulate these sort of uh, ideas uh, within the systems, in the school systems. It, that sort it's of a stuff. great question. I mean, I, I don't want to weigh in on opinion on those, but I think the thing, what I always tell people is. What we don't know about those statues uh, and, and, the, and the flag, let's say, of Mississippi is the history. And, and I think if you understand the history, then that'll help inform your decision on what you decide to do with these statues or whatever. These statues were not built, the, the, you know, well, let me, let me back up. So you had the Civil War, and then in the South you had Reconstruction where African Americans served in public office, you know, um, like never before. They were able to vote, they were able to serve in public office. You had uh, South Carolina and Mississippi together, e each one of them had more black elected officials, and it was incredible numbers of black elected officials during this period of time. Um, so what happened after the, the Union troops left in, in 1875, 1876, then the South kind of went reverted, you know what I mean, back to the, the way it was before, and in their own words, uh, reasserted white supremacy. You know, that, that was so, in 1890, Mississippi adopted a state constitution specifically designed to disenfranchise African Americans. And they said it out loud, yeah, I'm, you know, it's not like it was a secret. They said it out loud. 
And so they had a poll tax, and they used a poll tax, and they used a constitutional test that was basically, they started using circ clerks as kind of gatekeepers mm -hmm. to keep African Americans from being able to vote. You know, because they, the, the African Americans, you know, white voters came in, they go, or potential white voters came in, they go, oh yeah, Joe, I know you, yeah, you can have, you can vote. And someone African American walked in, so well, here's a test. And of course, they had to interpret some part of the Mississippi Constitution, which was crazy. It's a crazy Constitution anyway. But uh, anyway, and so they would, they would automatically fail, of course, they, they were black. It was kind of fascinating as there were some in the black community in Hattiesburg, which is where Vernon Damer's from, that kind of looked white, you know what I mean? I, you know, there's always the one drop rule in Mississippi. And oh, well, I guess we can explain that. But anyway, uh, so they would pass right away. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, yeah, you're fine. Go on in. You know, and so, to, so they put that in place to reinstitute white supremacy. It was a re rebellion as well, obviously, against Reconstruction and kind of thumbing their nose at, you know, the federal government otherwise. And then this is when the Mississippi flag came to be. It was not, it didn't come to be in the 1860s or the 1870s. It was adopted in 1894 and incorporated the Confederate battle flag. And that's how the Mississippi flag came to be. The statutes, there is literally almost a Confederate statue at almost every courthouse in Mississippi. If you go to courthouse in Mississippi, in any county, virtually every county in Mississippi, if you go to courthouse, there is a Confederate statue. I mean, it's just there. What's, and all you have to do is go around and start paying attention to when they were built. They were not built, most of them, until the 1900s. So what does that tell you? This was a continuing part, you know, of this kind of reassertion of white supremacy. So if we understand the context historically of when these statues and flags came about, at least in my mind, that helps to, okay, now what do you do? Now do you know the true history? Uh, what's unfortunate is people forget their history. I mean, like you have people today, I have people will tell me, I'm, to this day, have people will say to me in the South, uh, well, you know, the Civil War wasn't fought over slavery. And they say it with a straight face. They say it's the state's rights. And, of course, I always go, well, the right to do what? <laughs> and the right to own people is property, right? And, of course, the other thing I do is I just point him to the Mississippi Articles of Secession, which is only about three, three or four paragraphs and only mentions slavery, oh, seven times, I think, you know. So it's pretty, it says on the face of it, it has everything to do with slavery. So we need to know our history. This is why history is important. Yeah, thanks, good question. Go ahead. You, you mentioned the one person who, um, I don't know if you said reconcile or redemption or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, tried to. Uh, Bill Roy Pitts, yeah. Is that common or is that the no, exception? No, it's rare. It's been very and, rare. Yeah. And realistically, when you talk to the other people. Yeah, they're unrepentant. They're, did, they're, they're unchanged. How did they respond to the Electoral College win for Trump? Well, I didn't, I didn't have a conversation, you know, like, you know, with some of the guys that we're talking about. I mean, you're talking about, like, white supremacists I know. Um, the white supremacists I know are basically supporting Trump, but, you know. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story along those lines. It's not in the book, is... One of the guys in the book, you'll see white supremacist guy who kind of was a source for me, his name is Richard Barrett, which he's a whole nother, you can almost do a whole book on Richard. He's a weird guy. Uh, anyway, interesting. But he interestingly told me, you know, you know, you know, not to be quoted, but Richard's dead now, I don't mind telling you, is he told me he basically secretly supported Obama. And you're going to be going, what? Let me explain. According to Richard, his philosophy was this. If Obama was elected, there would be a great white backlash to that. And people would, would, would respond in reaction to that. I find that very interesting now. <laughs> I find that very interesting that he said that. And uh, 
anyway, it's interesting. So I, you know, I mean, mostly, you know, David Duke, I know supports, you know, I've, I've interviewed him before, supports Trump, but, you know, that, that you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know of any, any other, any other, you know, things that they're kind of talking about along those lines. Go ahead. Uh, Jerry, wonderful talk, and it sounds like there is a, a, a lot of work still to be done. Yes, there is. Um, and as a retired journalist, I, I know you're identified as a reporter for the Clarion Ledger. I don't know if that's a continuing status. Well, I'm doing the nonprofit now, but yeah, okay. I'm still doing what I do, so, investigative reporting. So my question really is um, with the impact of the loss of, of, of local newspapers yes. and journalists in doing this kind of work and doing this kind of reporting. How important was the Clarion Ledger in, in, in this and, what do, you, and, and, what, and yeah. what do you see about the impact of the loss of, of, of journalists and, and, and local newspapers in particular um, on well, your work? Well, it's a huge vacuum. You, you don't have that support. You know, like, like I started a nonprofit just from a standpoint of in order to keep doing what, I, what I've been doing, I wanted to be able to support that instead of because what's happening is newsrooms are shrinking. How investigative well I know. reporting just goes out the window. So were you, most of yeah. your work, was it done through, the, when yeah, you worked the for the Clarion Ledger? Ledger? Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, I and would they be able to do that kind of work now, or are they? No, they don't have the manpower to do right. it. Right. Yeah. My fear, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why we started this Center for Investigative Reporting, because what we're doing is every major newspaper in Mississippi practically is running our stories. Excellent. Like our prison stories. So we're actually able, in a sense, to get those stories out to more people and right. more people reading them than when I was at the Clarion Ledger. You just have to find a source of funding. Bingo. That's it. You got it. Right. That's right. it. Okay. Yeah, if you know anyone, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you address for a moment the role of the Department of Justice in opening the investigations, both from a local perspective, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Mississippi, to the... Uh, folks in the building across the street. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was kind of an interesting history. I mean, um, the FBI was always kind of suspicious generally of the Mississippi and Alabama authorities, you know. And so um, they, just, they just historically were. In fact, if you go to, to the Birmingham church bombing case, Bill Baxley brought a case in the 70s. It was 77 when Bob Chambliss was convicted. And he had a, a, he had a very difficult time getting any, anything out of Justice Department on that case. And the FBI. Yeah, and the FBI. Yeah, both. Both. <laughs> both. And so they were very reluctant. And so that reluctance carried on even into the Byron Deal Beckwith case. But gradually began to kind of soften a little bit during that case. They still had to, it was still a lot of, you end up playing these games, which is, or they did, you know, the prosecutors, the local prosecutors kind of had to play a little bit of games with the FBI, and you, you know, because, you know, they can't tell you the names of informants, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That, that was kind of what they were doing. By the time the Damer case came along, uh, the attorney general from Mississippi named Mike Moore, he was able to get the, he knew Janet Reno, had a relationship with Janet Reno, who was the attorney general at that time. And so he was actually able to get the FBI to share its entire case file on the Vernon Damer case and then later the Mississippi Burning case. So that was, that was, you know, so it kind of began to evolve over time. In 2000, I think I'm getting my years right, in 2006, I think it was, the Justice Department announced they were going to begin to look at these cases. There had already been legislation but, that had been proposed but never had passed that called the Emmett Till Bill. And the whole idea behind it was to go and look at all these cases. So that finally passed. I can't remember what year it passed. I think 2007 or so. But it eventually passed. And then they be kind of the FBI kind of fanned out and began to look at these cases across uh, the country. The thing, you know, the, the other thing I should say, the FBI did and Justice Department did bring some of these cases. They, the Ernest Avance case, the um, 
get all these cases. So it was, yeah, Benchester White with Ernest Avance was convicted in that. And then James Ford Seal, who was convicted in the killings of Henry Hezekiah D. and Charles Eddie Moore. So that, the, these were federal cases brought entirely by the feds. And then the Birmingham case was essentially a federal case. But then what they did was they kind of pivoted so they could prosecute it through state court through a murder statute. So they actually were specially designated, you know, special attorney generals for the state of Alabama in prosecuting that case. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, Senator. Senator Doug, Doug, Doug Jones. Jones. Yeah, Senator Doug, Doug Jones, Jones, current senator for Alabama, Doug Jones, is the one who prosecuted those cases. Uh, there were two guys convicted, Bobby Cherry, uh, who I went and interviewed, and uh, Tommy Bland. Yeah, Bobby Cherry claimed he was watching wrestling that night. And uh, I caught him in the lie. <laughs> yeah, he got, he was convicted. So, all right. Any other questions? That's it? Oh, no, one more. Okay. All right. You, you currently live in Mississippi? I do. In Jackson? I do. I, I visited there once a few years back, and so yep. I had an interesting experience. I'm curious, from your perspective, from historical background that you know of and you've taught us today, how have things been in regards to the racist aspect? Obviously, it still exists, but would you say, you know, things opening up, uh, anything positive aspects that you see or things that we need sure. to be aware of that are still there? Well, I think you get, it's mixed. I mean, I think uh, the good news is uh, in places, you know, you, don't, you think about these cases, not necessarily, you know, some people don't think, well, what what's it matter? You know, what does it matter to do these cases? Well, I'll tell you, and this is not even in the book, but it's kind of the rest of the story. Um, so Edgar Ray Kiln was finally convicted in the, in the Mississippi burning case, in the killings of those three young men in 2005, actually on the exact anniversary, June 21st of 2005. And what's interesting about it is two years later, Philadelphia, that's the, the town there, the city of Philadelphia, elected its first African-American mayor. And the thing that's interesting about that is Philadelphia is two-thirds white. And to date, he has continued to be reelected without opposition. So I think that's kind of, I, I think, you, you, know, the, you know, kind of the, the standard thought about Neshoba County was this place will never change. It's recalcitrant. There's no hope. I think there's hope. I think there's hope uh, that there are signs of hope in various places, but we need to search them out and we need to talk about them. And, and I think the other thing is we as a nation have not been very good about con conversing about race or, or our history or our past. I think it's like we're scared to talk about it. I know in the South, in, in Neshoba County too, I'm talking about, you know, when I first went around talking to people, that would be like, they didn't want to talk about that unpleasantness, you know, like killing three people is the same as like a, a, a bad bridge game or something. You know what I mean? You know, I, it's just, it was amazing to me how they equated the two. But um, anyway, but a great question. I don't have all the answers, but I do think we need to know our history. And I think when we really know our history, like we were talking about before about um, what do we do about the flag or what do we do about monuments, we need to know our history. Um, I mean, what if every, and this is not speaking one way or the other, but what if every Confederate statue actually had a big plaque that kind of explained that history? You know what I mean? Or told that story. I mean, I think that's, you know, the true story, not, not, the, you know, not the lost cause story that they often have on these statues and, and, and other things like that, but the true story of what really happened. You know, anyway. Those are just thoughts. But thanks so much for coming, and I guess we're signing books now. Thank you.